reevaluation, new beginnings, a time to recognize God's grace in our lives, to find ways that let that realization sink in and take root, drawing closer to God as we are changed by His love. In this season, we should give. Give of ourselves, our time, money, possessions. Giving helps us to see better the needs of those around us and brings to light those things that may have too high a priority in our lives. It helps us to separate what we need from what we want, stripping away the things that keep us separated from one another and God. We should fast. It helps us to be reminded of the need for God to fill us. Whether food or social media, your phone or TV, fasting allows us to physically feel the ongoing needs of the soul. It helps us to see the truth that only God can truly satisfy. We should pray. It slows us down, focuses us on God. Prayer allows us to be pulled away from our grip on this world and everything we think it can give us and it moves us closer to seeing God in the midst of it all. God is inviting us into this holy season, wanting us to be free from all the obstacles that keep us from His fullness. May we allow ourselves to be cleansed and renewed so that we may come to understand more powerfully the love of God and be made new in His righteousness and alive in His grace. It is the first Sunday of Lent. Can you believe it? 2024. That's why we have purple all over the church. And even Ron used his purple guitar this morning. So that's how serious we are about, about Lent. Uh, we welcome our friends uh, from Auckland, New Zealand today. We say hello to you. I think it's about 6 or 7 in the morning when you're waking up. We say hi to everyone in here, everyone out there. Uh, we're beginning a new series today. So if you are here for the first time, this is a wonderful time to, to start with us. And it is called The Chosen, and it is based on the incredible television movie series, The Chosen. Uh, And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but I want to just lift up our win for the week. Our Wednesday night dinners were fabulous this last Wednesday. So every Wednesday through Lent, we have a Wednesday night dinner, and we had an incredible Ash Wednesday service right after that. So come on out on Wednesday. Uh, You'll enjoy it. But how many people here have seen one or two or any of the episodes of The Chosen? Anybody? Okay. Couple. couple. All right. Um, well, let's start with the game. Um, let's play the which is better, uh, the book or the, or the movie game, okay? Let's, let's start. Uh, Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter. The, the book or the movie? Anyone? The book? Okay. 100%. Uh, here's another one. The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. The book or the movie? Shirley Mills, Henry Fonda, not good enough for you? Okay, all right, I agree with you, I agree with you. Uh, Lord, of the, Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien, the book or the movie? Both pretty good, right? Um, uh, Les Miserables, the book or the movie? The play, yeah, well said. <laughs> yes, indeed, we are. Uh, okay, here's, here's the big question for you. Which is better, the Bible or the chosen TV series? We are in church. This should be an easy answer. Of course, the Bible is better. But but there is one respect in which the chosen is better than the Bible. And that is it knits together the stories of the Bible. Um, As a person who studied the Bible a while, and Beth has too, the Bible has the tendency to feel like it's these people are out on a limb, like like birds on a limb. They're not connected. Uh, and there's a series of events that happen, and then, and then, and then, and then. But what I didn't realize until seeing this series is how interconnected, how knit together the first century world was. Peter knew Pilate, and Matthew knew Herod, and Mary Magdalene knew Nicodemus. They're all connected. It's basically a big, small town, the Bible, the New Testament. And, and we live in a small town. You know, Burlingame is a small town. You walk down Broadway, there's my favorite sandwich shop owned by my friend. A little further down, there's Father Michael. You run into Father Michael, 
a little further down, there's the kindergarten teacher who taught my kid, and a little further down is my friend from the synagogue, and they all know each other. They're all connected, and that's how the Bible is and was. So I hope you enjoy this series. Um, check out the welcome desk on the way out if you haven't seen it. Uh, you can see it on Prime, Netflix. Uh, you can stream it in lots of different ways. So today we're going to talk, talk about episode one of season one. We're talking about Mary Magdalene. As you know, we've just finished a series, um, and we're going to continue the year of agape. If this was an agape sermon, we could say that this is agape love to someone who has fallen, to someone who has fallen. And the title of today's message, though, is Far Away is Actually Very Close. Far Away is Very Close. God, we come to you today um, recognizing that you are very close to us, even though some of us feel far away from you. And Lord, there are people in our lives who are very, 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 very far away from you. But Lord, we, we give you those people And maybe there is someone here today who feels that way. And I pray that by the power of my words through the Holy Spirit, that you would help us to realize that people who are very far away are actually very close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever had the experience of calling somebody a nickname and then you find out their real name and you just feel a lot closer to that person? Uh, growing up, uh, my name Graham was, you know, like low-hanging fruit for nicknames, right? Grandma, Grandpa, Graham Cracker, uh, Grandma Lama Lama Ding Dong. I mean, it just went on and on growing up. At seminary, I was called Tetragrammaton, which I didn't mind because that is the Hebrew name for God. Uh, but when people would call me my real name, Graham Jesse Baird. I would know that either one, they knew me deeply, or two, I was in trouble. Mary Magdalene had probably a lot of nicknames, but the name that she's, she's called in The Chosen is Lilith. Now, she most likely was not called Lilith, but if, if you were to pick a nickname for Mary Magdalene, Lilith would be a good choice, because it is the Hebrew name for demon. And Mary had lots and lots of demons. If she wasn't called Lilith, she would have called, been called some of the other names that people would have called her prostitute, demon-possessed, depressed, anxiety-prone, person with suicidal tendencies, schizophrenic, alcoholic, drug user, vagrant, homeless woman, defiled one, unclean woman of the night. Any of those would have applied. She went by all of them. But, but the pivotal moment in episode one of season one is when she encounters Jesus, and she's at a bar, and she's getting a drink, her umpteenth drink, and uh, Jesus comes and stands next to her, and he, he knows her, and she walks out, and she says, I don't want anything to do with you. Get away. And Jesus, from afar, looks at Lilith in the eyes and says, Mary of Magdala. He calls her by name, and she is known, and she has been known known her whole life. And then Jesus, in this series, speaks, I think, some of the most comforting words in the whole Bible over her. Psalm 139. And if you take nothing else from today's message, go home and, and, and Look at Psalm 139. It's right smack dab in the middle of the Bible. It is the most comforting words that God speaks over us. These these words would have been spoken over Mary when she was a little girl, and when her father was putting her to bed, he would read Psalm 139 over her. So I want to, as we begin Lent, read Psalm 139 over you. And as you hear these words, hear the most comforting God who knows you deeply, has always known you, and always will. Let's read it together, or I'll read it, and then you just drink it in. This is Psalm 139, verse 1. You have searched to me, Lord, and you know me. The implication here is God knows everything about us and knows us. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. 
You, you discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all of my ways. My favorite new tech device in my life is a ring doorbell. Does anybody have one? Or These are amazing. I can know at any point in the day exactly who's visiting my house. I have a mattress being delivered to the house right now, and I have my phone. I will know when the mattress is being delivered. But even better than a ring doorbell, God knows you're coming, you're going, you're lying down, you're sitting up. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. Maybe you have someone like that in your life who just knows what you're about to say even before you say it. You hem me in, behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. I had the honor of laying my hand on many of you on Ash Wednesday as we put ashes in your forehead. That's a powerful experience. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, there you are. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. This is a like mind-blowing theological idea. Even if we were in hell, God would be there. God is the God of heaven. God is the God of opposite from heaven. God is everywhere. You would be there. You are there. I love this. This could be William Butler Yeats. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even your, your hand will guide me. Your, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. Again, another powerful notion. God redefines the darkness as light. Now, that's not dark. That's, that's light. God not only turns darkness into light, God embodies darkness and just makes it light. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my womb, in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know them full well. Again, Jesus is speaking these words over Mary Magdala, who felt very far from God. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I love this. The notion is that God didn't plan all the stuff of your life, but knew that it would happen even before you were born. God wrote it in God's book of life. How precious to me are your thoughts, God, how vast the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And then the psalmist closes, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is anything offensive in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Again, Jesus' name is The Way. One of our banners on the side here. Jesus is the way, and he will lead us in the way. So that's Mary Magdala. Jesus knew her, he, he named her, and he spoke those words over her. And Jesus knows you better than you'll ever know yourself. And Jesus knows that person in your life that has totally fallen and names them and reminds them of who they are. Now, of course, there's a long distance between Mary's birth in 2 BC, somewhere thereabouts, in about 30, 30 AD, she had the hardest life. The hardest. And I don't know why some people have harder lives than others, but some people do. I'll never forget this kid that I used to babysit in, in high school, Matt. Amazing kid. And uh, smart, talented, had, had everything going for him, played in a rock band, got in with the wrong crowd, began to start to take drugs and stuff, and became addicted, and his life began to spiral. He got into treatment, but after he gets clean, he finds out that he has a, a terminal illness and he dies in his 30s. His parents are coming to visit me in a week or so. 
There's some people whose lives are just so hard. But in the midst of that, God still knows those people, and God still knows us. So that's probably not you today. There's probably no Mary Magdala's here today. But, but there may be some worshiping with us online, or maybe you have someone in your life who just seems so far away from God. But, but I believe God's word for us today is that that person is way closer than they would ever imagine. And that's my first point. Places and people that are far away from God are very close. Uh, was I the only one who watched Sesame Street growing up? I love Sesame Street. I wanted to live on Sesame Street. Can you tell me how to get? How to get to Sesame Street? I loved Kermit the Frog. I loved Grover. I loved the little educational bits throughout it. Um, so if you're of my generation, you remember, there was one famous little bit called Near and Far. Do you remember that one? It's where uh, I think Grover or Mick Kermit would come up to the camera and be like, hi-ho, Kermit the end, and then be like, near, and then do like a little dance, and then far, and then I don't dance, but near, and then further away, far, and then keep going, then go out the side door, and then you'd hear like the clanging of like pots and pans. In case you didn't see it, um, it's fine. But from that experience, I learned, as a young kid, the difference between near and far. But near and far is different for God. The things that seem far in our lives are near to God. And a little later, I remember taking a physics class, and the physicists in the room, Dr. Beth, can help me with this one, and I learned about the space-time continuum. And the notion here, and help me out after the service, uh, but there's three dimensions, space, height, depth, width, but there's time, and time is the fourth dimension, and that somehow these, these four dimensions work together, it continues, it somehow loops back on itself. I'm sure I messed that up, but, but, but maybe there's a kind of God-space continuum. The things that seem far from our lives are very close to God. And this is reflected in the text. Um, there's, a, a wonderful, uh, there's a wonderful text of, of I, even if I was far away from you, far across the ocean, I would be near to you. In the first episode, Nicodemus is featured. And he's one of my favorite characters in the New Testament. He's the Sadducee, the Pharisee, who comes and visits Jesus and asks what it means to be born again. But if there was a holy person, it was Nicodemus. He was perfect in the law. He was perfect in the kosher laws. He was clean. He was was a religious person. But he's not the one who's close to Jesus. It's Mary. It's Mary who Jesus decides to reveal himself to in the resurrection. And we'll look at that in a couple of weeks on Easter. And so when Jesus says, when he first meets Mary, Mary He then says that again in the garden, Mary. So things that are far and near. Uh, Second, God's plans for our lives are so much better than our own plans and way more complete. I had a couple of friends visit from England this last week. I was so excited. I couldn't wait to show them everything. We only had a couple of days. So I wanted to just make the most of the time we had. And so I planned out everything, you know, the meals, things they would want to eat, the stuff we would do, go to the top of the mark, Every, we would just show them everything in like two and a half days. We would have the Rolls Royce of San Francisco Burlingame tours. It's just I didn't plan for certain things, like that my daughter would be sick in bed for the first day of the trip, or that it would rain on Wednesday and not such a good day for surfing. Or that a certain football team would lose the Super Bowl. Anybody need a a grief recovery group after last week's game? Talk to Gretchen at at the welcome table. We can get one of those. But God's plans are so much better. This text says, All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them ever came to be. And I don't care how great of a planner you are. You will never outplan God. In fact, the best way to outplan God is 
Or the best way to show that you are not a great planner is to try to outplan God. God's the great planner. So the third and, and most important thing today as we begin Lent is just as Jesus came for Mary Magdala to redeem her life, he came for you to redeem your life. And I don't mean halfway redeem. I don't mean a little bit redeem. I mean fully redeem your life. I uh, just want to lift up one of the most powerful stories of redemption I've heard in a while. Does anyone remember a baseball player named Lou Johnson from 1965, Los Angeles Dodger? He was an amazing player. I know the Dodgers are a sore subject, especially after last week, but amazing player. He hit the winning uh, home run for the World Series for the Dodgers in 1965. Not long after... Lou uh, Johnson uh, develops a drug addiction and alcohol addiction, and he has to pawn off all of his stuff in order to pay his bills. And one day, he, uh, he loses his Super Bowl ring when drug dealers come, or Super Bowl, or World Series ring when, when dealers come to take whatever they need to take. He, he loses it. So for 30 years, he looks for his ring. Can't find it. His coach, or his... Uh, President uh, Bob Graziano discovers the ring online before it goes on auction and buys it for Lou Johnson for $3,457, which tells you it was a few years ago that this purchase was made. So Lou is given the ring. He thought he'd never see it again. And Lou says, I felt like a piece of me had been reborn. God bought you a ring. He paid for it with his life on a cross. He bought it, and he wants to give it to you. And that's, that's what Jesus gave to Mary, this ring that could never be taken away. It was a gift. And it was him knowing her deeply. And God's given you that ring. And if you haven't taken that ring, all you have to do is ask for it. Thank you so much, Lord, that your promise about redemption is true. It's 100% redemption through you, that you redeem that which is lost. So we give our lives to you at the beginning of Lent. We commit our lives to you in a new way. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for calling us by name. As you called Mary by name, you call us by the name that we've been known since we were a child. You call us by our full name. Not a nickname, but your true name. In Jesus' name.